Hey, Clo. Hey, Rodrigo. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien, ¿y tú cómo estás? Bien, bien. Sabes que en este momento, muy buena... Tiene mi boya. ¿Estamos uh -huh. en vivo? Sí. Ok. Estamos... Buenas tardes a todos. Estamos un poco de sorpresa porque estábamos aquí conversando. Hemos decidido comenzar 10 minutos antes de la programación para estar eh, con Daisy y con Paloma y dialogar un poquito sobre la programación que tenemos hoy día, de qué trata y, y así la gente pueda saber un poco qué le espera y a qué eh, prestar más atención. Hola, hola Daisy. Hola, ¿cómo están? Buenas tardes a todos. Mucho gusto. Hola, Palo. Hola, hola a todos. Oye, pero bueno, comencemos, comencemos comentando. Eh, ¿Cuál es la primera actividad, Palo? Más o menos, algo ligerito, todavía no una intro. La primera actividad la tenemos con Clotilde. Eh, ya está aquí, eh, uh -huh. esperando. Y nada, ella nos hablará un poquito acerca de, de la importancia ¿no? de, de buscar las raíces de nuestros ancestros, porque ella tiene un proyecto muy chulo que se llama My China Roots. Y bueno, nos hablará un poquito de eso. Sí, está genial, sí. Bueno, yo, yo he tenido... Eh, a ver, en general, Clotilde como varios otros miembros de My China Woods, tiene mucha experiencia haciendo conferencias acerca de la genealogía, que es un tema tan importante en un mundo transnacional como el actual. Así que, eh, nada, espero lo mejor de una ponente que tiene mucha, mucha experiencia. ¿Y de ahí qué sigue? ¿De ahí qué sigue? De ahí sigue el evento de Mujeres Tusanes, que se titula ¿Dónde está la mujer Tusan? Y es uno de nuestros, bueno, o sea, no os lo podéis perder, básicamente, porque por fin damos a conocer ¿no? a uno de, de los proyectos en que hemos estado trabajando estos últimos, estos últimos meses. Hemos centrado mucho en crear bueno, un, un espacio, ¿no? un grupo feminista dentro de Tusanaje. Entonces, eh, cuatro mujeres Tusanes súper potentes, con trayectorias súper interesantes, nos van a contar un poquito ¿no? acerca de, de sus trayectorias de vida y de qué están trabajando en, en Tusanaje. Uh -huh. Sí, es bien importante, ¿no? Porque para yo como hombre eh, considero sumamente importante que todo el tiempo se visibilice que tu sanaje es un proyecto hecho por muchísimas mujeres, ¿no? Como Daisy, que está acá con nosotros, como tú, Palo, y, y en realidad hay una enorme mayoría de mujeres. Hecho principalmente por mujeres. Eh, principalmente por mujeres. Lo fundamos... Principalmente por ¿no? mujeres. Y dos son mujeres, Sumi y tú, ¿no es cierto? Entonces, claro, eso, eso es fundamental. Además, solo hay que ver la pantalla, solo hay que ver la pantalla y solo va a haber que ver todos, todos los eventos. O sea, hay una mayoría pues, de mujeres bastante interesante. Y, y eso ha hecho que el proyecto sea un proyecto este, que además tenga una, improma, una impronta feminista desde su origen, ¿no? O sea, siempre hemos sido absolutamente claros en eso, ¿no? Y, y además... ¿Cuántas cosas trabajamos que no salen al, al espacio público? Muchas cosas. La gente ve ciertos eventos de Zoom y cosas, pero atrás se trabaja muchísimo como este enorme trabajo que ha hecho Victoria. Victoria Hong Chung. Totalmente. Ella es la coordinadora de este, de este grupo, de este grupo feminista. Y nada, estará ella ahí coordinando, con, bueno, moderando esta actividad con las cuatro panelistas. Y os invito a que, eh, bueno... Mmm, Va a ser muy interesante. Yo es que estoy muy ilusionada porque yo presento esa, hago una introducción, ¿no? Digo, Ay, esto un poco y, y estoy muy ilusionada, la verdad. Sí, y luego tenemos el, el evento. ¿El evento? El evento. El evento de la, de la Europa. Tenemos Occidental. El evento. El Europa Occidental. ¿Cómo lo llamamos? De chiñoles. Sí, sí, ¿cómo lo llamamos? Porque siempre le decíamos antes, ¿te acuerdas? Le decíamos chiñoles, pero ya esa identidad ha quedado descartada, ¿no? A ver, el título es ¿Qué hay? Repensar, repensar la identidad, perspectivas de la diáspora china en España. Estamos hablando de ya, le hemos cambiado más formalito. La diáspora china en España. Exacto, es que se ha quedado un título que queda académico, pero porque desde que al principio hablábamos de chiñoles, porque chiñoles fue la palabra que utilizó Susana y la periodista que va a estar hablando de esto eh, acerca, de, acerca de este tema en su documental, también es un término que ha sido utilizado en prensa en, en, ¿no? en grupos de Facebook, en redes sociales, pero hay mucha gente que no le que esto 
no le parece un, un, un término no adecuado, entonces... Además, eh... además es un ciclo en nuestra época que los nombres, o sea, que discutamos la identidad y cómo nombramos las cosas. Es una cosa muy de nuestra generación. Por fortuna, Tuzán es una cosa que se fue cristalizando hace 60 años, entonces ya hoy es como... Sería un retroceso tratar de cuestionarlo, ¿no? Pero igual, acá en el Perú hay, es una identidad más quebrada que, por ejemplo, la de Nikkei, ¿no? Que es como más definida. Pero ¿quiénes vienen en la mesa de...? de viene, viene este genial cineasta, ya hablaste de nuestra querida amiga Susana, ¿cómo se llama? Gachi, Gachi, Básicamente, él eh, es un chico que ha hecho un cortometraje llamado Xiao Xian, que fue nominado a los premios Goya, aquí en España, son los premios de cine más importantes. Y mmm, bueno, estoy la verdad súper, súper ilusionada de que hoy vengan a contarnos un poquito ¿no? acerca de su proceso creativo, su proceso de identidad, de cómo está consiguiendo cambiar la narrativa acerca de los chinos en España a través de sus películas. Entonces, es un hombre súper potente. Después tenemos imprescindible a, eh, a Juan. Eh, ella es la autora del cómic Pacho Agridulce, una de las primeras. Yo cuando era adolescente yo leía a Juan y era mi única referencia. Ella aún no había publicado nada en papel, tenía un Tumblr y básicamente colgaba eh, cosas de su vida cotidiana y yo estaba como, esto es genial, ¿sabes? Esto es como lo mejor que hay en internet. Y ahora esa chica ha llegado súper lejos y, y estoy... Pues, muy contenta de que hoy esté con nosotros en, en tu canaje. Y por último está, estará Antonio Liu, que es un, un amigo mío que vive aquí en, en Valencia, donde, donde el, estamos. Es un... el, el rey de Valencia. <risa> Son sus dominios, ¿no? La una una persona que está en, en muchísimos campos diferentes, pero sobre todo en los últimos años se ha centrado en todo lo que es la formación intercultural, porque a él le interesa mucho, bueno, todo el tema de la educación, el, las clases en universidades, las clases en, también en empresas, en todo tipo para tratar cosas de, de sobre todo temas de entre cultura eh, china y española, pero bueno, también, también más cosas y nos contará mucho acerca de eso. Uh -huh. eh, como nos quedan pocos minutos, vamos a correr con lo demás, ¿ya? <risa> Eh, He monopolizado, ¿no? Se nota que los españoles otra vez monopolizando todo. Daisy, ¿tú estás este... ¿Hay, hay bulla o puedes conversar un poquito? No puedo hablar, eh, pero ya va a empezar el, el siguiente evento, así que podrían presentarlo. Voy a compartir sí, pantalla ya. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias por avisarnos. Ya, yeah, Paloma, so we have to switch on into English. Okay. This is our activity in English, the, the very, very first activity in English. Today, with this amazing friend of us, an old friend of us, in Tusanaje, she's Clotilde Yap. She belongs to this amazing startup, My China Roots, and she's a researcher uh, who built this bridge as the same as our project. Our friends of My China Roots work into the genealogy and this amazing enrichment of the culture that comes with the encounter with these two cultures when Chinese people get this migration, this journey to other places. Um, Paloma, I don't know what you, you have to say about this. <laughs> I think it's time for Let to, to speak because everyone is very excited to listen uh, what Clotilde have to say to all of us. And thank you Clotilde for joining us. No, thank you for having me. It's 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 great. I'm I'm really excited because we haven't really had the chance to work together on anything before. And and like Rodrigo said, I think there's there's a lot of overlap and parallels between what we do at My China Roots and, and what you guys are doing at Tusanaje. And it's been really exciting to see everything that you guys have been doing so far. So yeah, thank very you. happy to be here. Um, I'm just going to share my screen first. Go ahead. If I can figure out how to do it. <laughs> okay, cool. So I, I, the, the topic of, of my chat is about identity building and roots research. I want to keep it quite informal. What I'll do is talk about a few case studies um, of people who have gone on these roots investigations and what kind of things they got out of them with regards to their sense of identity. 
Uh, now, obviously, it's something that I feel very passionate about on a personal level, as well as because of the fact that it is my job. This is my everyday life. So um, as you can probably tell from the accent, I'm from, oh, I think I lost you guys. No, we're still here. Okay. No, yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Okay, I just great, disconnected great, great. the camera, but I'm like, listen. <laughs> okay, great. My, I hope my, my internet connection stays okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so a, a bit of background, I guess, because I grew up in the UK, but my mother is French and my dad is Chinese Malaysian. I grew up with this very confused uh, sense of self and identity. So when I think back on it, when I was a child, I didn't really question it that much. I was very proud and I, I was very, I was able to comfortably say, yes, I'm French. Yes, I'm Chinese, even though, e even though the only reasons I thought that I was Chinese was because I knew how to use chopsticks. And we went to have yum cha with my dad every weekend. That was enough for me back in those days. But of course you grow up and you meet other people who are also Chinese and you realize, wow, I'm so different from these people. I, I can't even speak the language. Um, I have, I feel completely disconnected from them. What does that mean about me? And I think that's what subconsciously urged me to go and study Chinese. So I started by learning the language when I was quite young and then studied at university, um, which led me to studying abroad in Beijing. Um, and so while I was in China, I thought, I thought that the, while I was there, I may as well go and visit the ancestral village that my great grandfather came from before he moved to Malaysia. Um, and so my surname is Yap, and I knew that the village was called Yap Village. And a long story short, when I arrived there, uh, it was it was a very strange spiritual experience, if you like because I didn't really know what to expect. And there were two things that happened when I was in the village that really shook me up. And the first one was, as I was walking around these alleyways, I had this very strange sense of time passing because I had never met my great grandfather. I only knew, in fact, I think you can see him in this big family picture. He's the old man sitting at the front. I only knew that he was a very stern, strict, um, man who smoked opium in the back of the house. He never spoke about his past, and and I'd never met him because I was I was I was born after he passed. But walking around those those little alleyways and hearing stories that people told me about him because they had met him was was a very strange feeling. I felt wow, so much time has passed since he has been walking here. And the second thing that happened was. I walked into a church in the village that he had helped build and I noticed there was a plaque with a lot of names in the front of the church and I was able to read his name and my great grandmother's name and also the name of my grandfather in Chinese and there were several things going through my head at that point. One was, wow, four years ago you would never have been able to read this or understand what, what it said um, and that was that, that was quite an emotional moment, I think, is that at that point, I felt much more connected to that place and to all of these people who were, who were with me, who were accompanying me and who were welcoming me in the village. It was something that I, I didn't really expect because I still felt like a runner. So that, that was my own experience of, of my root search. And shortly after, I, I was quite inspired. I did a lot of research into my, my family history, but then I stumbled upon my China roots. And so as, as um, you guys already introduced, we essentially specialize in helping people who have Chinese ancestry trace where they came from in China. Um, so the, the, the main challenges in this respect is that there's often a language barrier. A lot of people who have Chinese ancestry don't read Chinese, don't, don't understand Chinese anymore. So we try to create this bridge. So we, we, have, um, we have people who are based in China who can do the research for you. 
And the main things that we look for are things like uh, a temple, a clan temple, your ancestral house. So where was it that your, your, your great grandparents or your great great grandparents were living in China? If you're lucky, the house is still standing. Um, we also look for ancestral tablets. We look for a zupu, which is one of these, which is a very ancient family record that's kept in families for generations and generations. Um, so we try to bridge that gap firstly by having people on the ground in China, but also by, by, by trying to explain the context for these stories and the, these things that we're looking for. Um, because many people don't realize how different life is back there. And you may expect to, to find official records like you would in Western countries, like birth certificates and things like that. That's not really the case in, in a Chinese context. It's much more personal, it's much more human. You have, we have to speak to people. We have to go to the villages and speak to real people to ask them if they remember and what they remember. Um, of course, another challenge to this is not everyone can travel to China to do this kind of work and, and to connect with their roots. So we've been also working on an online platform at My China Roots that lets people do this themselves. So we have a surname finder. We also have a village finder. And we've recently released a new search engine that lets you search for an ancestor's name on our platform. And it scans through all of our digitized records of Zopu to see if there's a match. So that means it's no longer necessary for people to actually physically go to the village. They can take this shortcut. So if I have time at the end, I'll give you a little demo of, of what we've been doing. But the, yeah, the main difference between doing roots research in China and doing roots research elsewhere is that everything revolves around finding your village. And it's, it's interesting because home has been a central concept in Chinese culture for a long time. And if you, if you look at the history of China for a long time, it was an agrarian society, which means that most people were peasants, they were farmers, and they stayed on the land for, for generations and generations. So you do grow attached to the place that you grow up in after all of this time. Um, and it's also why you may have noticed if you've, if you've asked your grandparents and your great grandparents that after they left China, they often joined uh, associations in the new places where they lived. So for example, if you were from Punyu, you would have joined the Punyu club or the Punyu association in whatever city you're living in. Um, the point was to stick together with other people that, that came from the same place. Um, and this connection to your homeland, to your hometown was so strong that there is quite an old belief in, in Chinese culture that when you die, your bones should return to your ancestral land. So if, if you've had the chance to travel to Cuba, to, the, to Havana's Chinese cemetery, you may have had the chance to see these incredible um, niches inside the cemetery that have many bone boxes of people who people who died in Cuba and who were supposed to be repatriated back to China but of course because of political reasons they were never able to make it back so it's incredibly sad but it is a testament to this attachment to your to your homeland um, so <clears throat> When, when it comes to asking yourself how, what is the impact that Roots Research could have on, on you as a person? And why would you even, why would you even do it? What is the point of looking into the past and asking yourself these questions? And a lot of people who, who contact us actually at My Channel Roots, they tell us that they have asked their grandparents about, about where they came from and they always get a negative response. They say, why do you want to bring up the past? Why, um, why, why are you asking these questions? What's the point? Um, and it's important to remember that a lot of the people that left, 
left during a time that was quite traumatic. There were some crazy things happening in China. There was lots of internal chaos. And not only that, but when they left, almost in every single country that saw a large wave of Chinese migration, you had incredibly racist policies that were in place. That's the case in the US, in Canada, in Peru, in Australia, with the white Australia policy. It really was very widespread. So as a result of this, because of being distrusted from the very beginning, that does trickle down into the generation. So you have the first generation who arrives, who's incredibly um, fearful of being kicked out, of not being welcomed. But the problem with that, of course, is that when is that when you get to the third or fourth generation, there's a cutoff and you're unable to, to connect with with your ancestral stories in this in this scenario, um, so this is quite quite common across the across the diaspora. But in terms of the people that we've helped in the past at My China Roots, they they have they come from very various backgrounds. They come from all over the world. A lot of them come from North America, but we get plenty from Southeast Asia and the Caribbean as well. But and even though they come from very diverse backgrounds, even though they're of different ages, it seems that they all have this deep-seated desire to understand more about themselves. Um, and, and, and this trickles down to understanding more about themselves so that they can impart that knowledge onto the next generation. So I just wanna talk about some, some pretty interesting cases in my mind that we, that we worked on. So this is a picture of Leslie. Uh, she she worked with us a couple years back, and she's from the Dominican Republic, um, but has lived in the USA for all her life. And what was interesting with Leslie is she, her grandfather moved to the Dominican Republic from China. So she was a quarter Chinese. And when she initially contacted us, she was mostly interested in the intellectual process of why did he leave? Like, what were the historical reasons? What was his background? Uh, what, what pushed him to this particular place at this particular time? So we helped her kind of understand the context and then eventually we accompanied her back to her grandfather's village. And surprisingly, there was still a very large family over there. Um, she came just in time for Qingming Festival, which is the annual tomb sweeping festival in China, which is incredibly important where you pay respect to your ancestors. Um, and, uh, she came with her mother, who is half Chinese, and her mother at the beginning was not very interested in this, did, didn't really remember very much. But when her mother was in the village, suddenly she had all these memories coming back to her and she was flooded with, with, with emotion and started just remembering all of these things on the spot. Leslie was very different in terms of how she processed it because it was only after returning back home that it sunk in and she suddenly felt very connected to that place in Hoiping that she had been to because it was it was now also part of her, even though she didn't look Chinese or anything like that. So that was one of the stories that stood out in my mind. Um, and this next this next story is from Australia. So so we get a lot of cases of people who have children or have grandchildren who themselves are multicultural. And this is the case of Dennis. It was with the birth of his four grandkids that he decided, okay, now is the time I want to immortalize the knowledge that we have and, and, and secure that knowledge so that our grandkids, our great grandkids will always be able to, to know where they're from. Um, so Dennis, uh, Dennis had a couple notebooks from his, his grandfather who had moved to Australia and the grandfather had apparently sent back the names of his own Australian family back to the village in Maoming in Guangdong province. Um, now, he wasn't sure whether those records would still exist in China because then the Cultural Revolution happened and many records were actually destroyed. So. We accompanied him on a trip back to his village and were able to meet with, with local villagers. We were able to track down not only his maternal village, but his 
um, paternal village as well. And um, against all odds, we were able to find this book that is photographed here, which is the book of the whole clan uh, of the area. And it listed his own grandfather's name and his own father's name in the book. And this is an experience that a lot of people get is when they finally see the name in the book. It's a really uh, emotional, or as he described it, magical moment. Everything kind of falls into place. And there's something also about being in China and seeing tangible proof that um, that can be very moving. And this was this was one such case. If you're interested in reading Dennis's story, by the way, we just published it on our blog, so people can go home and read it if they want to. Um, and the final story, which is uh, which I find really fascinating, is of Stephanie from the U.S. So. The funny thing with Stephanie is she never knew about her great grandfather. And when she grew up, she was based, she moved around a lot because her parents worked on US um, air bases. So she felt very rootless. So as an adult, she started to dive into her family history. And she found out that her grandfather was the first Chinese to ever reach the North Pole. He was a scientist. Uh, he was once sent to represent China at the UNESCO during World War II. And funny enough, he was also a radio broadcaster for the Voice of China during World War II. The really funny thing is that without even realizing, Stephanie had been a radio broadcaster herself in the US. So she discovered there was this crazy parallel between her and her great grandfather that she had never realized. Um, and I can really relate to that, having having investigated some parts of my family tree. Sometimes you come across something and you, you realize, oh, wow, that's why. It's because of this thing that happened in 1921 that my dad is the way he is and that I am the way I am. So it gives you a crazy sense of um, of time passing and also how you are the result of all of these teeny tiny little decisions that were made hundreds of years ago. Uh, it gives you a great sense of perspective, I think. So yeah, this is a really wonderful story. You can keep a lookout for it on our blog. Um, and that is about it for my talk. I mean, in, in yeah, in, in conclusion, really the, the point of doing re roots research is not to be able to say at the end, yes, I'm X percent Chinese. That's, that's not the point. And in any case, that word Chinese and Chinese diaspora is so fluid. And there are so many variations in the Chinese experience, even within a certain country. Um, so, so in my opinion, it's really more about the process and I think through the process of investigating where you come from and your family tree, you can gain a lot of personal growth. But also I would even say in, in these crazy times that are incredibly fragmented and politically polarized, it's, it's just nice to remember that, that um, this is gonna sound really cheesy, but there are parallels and experiences everywhere. And we are all somehow interconnected because we are the result of all of these teeny tiny decisions that took place so long ago. So yeah, I hope this was enjoyable to you all. And thank you again for having me. Thank you, Gabriele. Uh, yeah, I don't know, like I think that your talk was very, very inspiring. We have been uh, collaborating for a time, but I have never had like the opportunity to listen to you, how you explain this. And I think uh, your talk was also very touching. I really like the stories that you shared. Um, I'm curious about your own story, about your own, you know, looking for roots, but maybe it can be like, you know, another opportunity, another, another talk, right? And um, so, yeah, we have to, we have here like some comments on the Facebook that we are congratulating you, congratulating Tutanaje and saying that this talk uh, 
uh, was very interesting. So yeah, uh, I just want yeah. to say thank you everyone to follow us. And then um, I have to say that kind of in- question? Could I? Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. I, I just wanna, I was thinking while you were talking, how a talk like yours can inspire, as Paloma said, different persons in different ways, because I'm totally sure that it talks to me in a different way as Paloma, because for example, Paloma, you know, she's second generation, her parents are Chinese, she talks in Chinese with them. And when she wanna know something about, you know, her Chinese ancestors, as once I told you, Paloma, you remember? I said, when you wanna know something, you just call your dad and ask your dad. So it's totally different with a situation like mine, right? I have to seek for things, I have to search, I have to, you know, as, as you taught me someday, when you send me a PPT, I remember, you know, you have to go to the Toms, you have to go to the Hui Kuan and that, those stuff. But my question is, Clotilde, it's a bit, a bit different, a bit apart. Um, you have traveled through different parts of the world and you have visited different diasporas, different Chinese diasporas. And of course you have, you have found out that they are totally different. No, maybe not totally, but different characteristics when they mix with the local society and local culture. And my question is, what did you notice? What was the main characteristic you found when you came to Lima? What did you find about uh, Peruvian Chinese or Tucson people that you said, oh my God, that's a bit different. Yes, the thing that I found was different. And maybe it's because I was hanging out with, with your friends, Rodrigo, back in Lima, was that I thought, wow, these, these, these two sons are so proud and they, they're not, and, and they're very vocal about it. I met a couple of your friends who, who you know, were saying, yes, I'm, I'm Tucson or I'm Hakka 100%. And, and they feel this incredible connection without necessarily speaking Hakka or speaking the language or, you know, and they may, may be fourth or fifth generation. Um, and of course you find the sense of pride in, in other places, but not to such an extent. So that was what surprised me. Um, mm -hmm. yes. In, yes. In general, talking, talking in general about the Chino Latino identity, what can you say? Are they different from, for example, Chinese Americans, Chinese Canadians, Chinese Australians or not? Oh, well, I can't say that they're the same because they definitely are not the same. Uh, I, when, when you move to a different place, you can't help but imbibe some of the local culture. So I find that the Chinese Latinos that I do meet, they, they also have a lot of Latino um, customs and characteristics and, and particular tastes, you know, in, in what they like to do or how, what, what they like to eat. Um, but I would find, yes, I, I, I guess I just don't know enough to be able to draw parallels or, you know, I don't want to say anything that's, that's too, um, yeah. That's, that's, that's good. Too enough. absolute. <laughs> I don't know if Paloma has another question. You have another question? Mm -hmm. I don't Paloma? have any other question, actually. I mean, I just wanted to say that in seven minutes, Another talk is going to start with this the one about the trans women, about the feminist uh, group that we have in, in Tutanaje. So in seven minutes, we'll come back. In siete minutos, volvemos con, con la actividad de, de las mujeres tusanes. Así que nada, os esperamos. Matilde, <laughs> muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Gracias a vosotros. Hasta Bye -bye. luego. Chao. Bye -bye.